Up next is the oral research paper presentation. To open this session, please welcome Dr. Iris L. Riel, medical oncologist and clinical associate professor at the University of the Philippines. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Asian Oncology Society Conference oral research presentation. I will introduce the presenters for this segment and their respective research titles one by one. The first presenter is Dr. Bai Han Song from the Department of Hematology, Hospital of Southwest Medical University, Luzhou, China. He will talk about his research entitled PLA2G4A is a cell cycle related gene predicting shorter overall survival in patients with non-M3 NPM. The next presenter is Dr. Liana Rich Herrera from the Department of Physical Sciences, College of Science, Polytechnic University of the Philippines. She will talk about in silico approach in designing a novel multi-epitope vaccine candidate for non-small cell lung cancer cells overexpressing G protein coupled receptor 56. The third presenter is Dr. Dennis Lee Sakdalen from the University of the Philippines College of Medicine, Philippine General Hospital. He will speak on the research entitled Mismatch Repair Status Among Filipino Patients with Young Onset Colorectal Cancer. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Han Song Bai, and my supervisor is Professor Min Zeng. Today, our topic is PLA to G4A is a potential biomarker predicting shorter overall survival in patients with non-M3 NPM1 wild type acute myeloid leukemia. Here is the overall background of our article. In this study, we aim to explore and validate the prognostic value of PLA to G4A expression in patients with non-M3 NPM1 wild type acute myeloid leukemia using two independent data sets. Data from the TCGA LAML and the target AML were used to assess the prognostic value of PLA to G4A in NPM1 WTAML cases. A single cell RNA set data set that included 96 AML cells from a recurrent AML case was used to check the correlation between PLA to G4A expression and the functional state of AML cells. Results show that non M3 AML cases had significantly increased PLA to G4A expression compared to normal peripheral blood samples. Multivariate analysis showed that high PLA to G4A expression was independently associated with shorter overall survival. The prognostic value was validated based on 128 AML cases in target. Single cell RNA seq data suggested that PLA to G4A expression was positively correlated with cell cycle progression of AML cells. Therefore, PLA to G4A expression might serve as an independent prognostic marker in OS in patients with non M3 NPM1 WTAML. Its upregulation might confirm malignant phenotype of AML cells, at least partly by promoting cell cycle progression. Future molecular studies are required to explore other molecular pathways involved. And let's see the figures of our article. Figure one shows that PLA to G4A expression was significantly upregulated in primary AML than in normal peripheral blood sample. Picture A shows the exonic structure of PLA to G4A transcripts and comparison of the transcript expression in peripheral blood and in normal blood samples. Picture B shows the data availability in TCGALAML. Picture C shows the comparison of PLA to G4A expression in different cytogenetics risk categories. Picture D shows the comparison of PLA to G4A expression in different FAB classification of AML cases in TCGA. Picture E shows the comparison of PLA to G4A expression in non-M3 and M3 AML cases. Figure two shows the PLA to G4A expression was associated with unfavorable OS in patients with NPM1 WTAML in TCGA. Picture A shows the KM curve analysis of OS in non-M3 AML cases in TCGA LAML. 
picture B shows the comparison of PLA to G4A expression between non-M3 MPM1 WT and non-M3 MPM1 MPAML cases. Picture C and D shows the subgroup of KM curve analysis of OS in non-M3 MPM1 WT and MTNM AML cases. Figure three shows the PLA to G4A expression was associated with unfavorable OS in patients with MPM1 WT AML in target. Picture A shows the data availability in target AML. Picture B shows the comparison of PLA to G4A expression in different cytogenetic risk categories in target AML datasets. Picture C shows the KM curve analysis of OS in non-M3 AML cases in target AML. Picture D shows the comparison of PLA to G4A expression between non-M3 MPM1 WT and non-M3 MPM1 MTA ML cases. Picture E shows the subgroup of KM curve analysis of OS in non-M3 MPM1 WTA ML cases. Figure four shows the potential regulatory network of PLA to G4A in AML. PLA to G4A centered gene to gene functional interaction network showing the genes with physical interactions shared signaling pathways and predicted interactions with PLA to G4A. The network was generated by using gene mania. Then we assess the prognostic value of significance of PLA to G4A expression in the NPM1 WT subgroup. Older age patients in poor and intermediate risk groups and high PLA to G4A expression were, were risk factors of poor OS as shown in table one. And the multivariate analysis confirmed that high PLA to G4A expression was an independent indicator of unfavorable OS after adjustment for the other two risk factors. Altogether, the univariate and multivariate analysis in this data set suggested that PLA to G4A expression was an independent indicator of shorter OS in non-M3 MPM1 WT cases as a continuous variable. At last, we can draw two conclusions as shown as the shown above data sets. The first is that PLA to G4A is expression might serve as an independent prognostic marker in OS in patients with non-M3 MPM1 WT AML. Second, PLA to G4A upregulation has multiple effects on the malignant phenotype of AML cells together with its partners. Future molecular studies are required to explore the detailed regulatory network involved. That's the end of my sharing. Thank you. Good day. I'm Leanne Herrera from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines College of Science. Allow me to briefly share one of my research works entitled In Silico Approach in Designing a Novel multi epitope Vaccine Candidate Against Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer with Overexpressed G-Protein Cobalt Receptor 56. Lung cancer continues to be the most common cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide. It can be usually divided into two main categories based on how it appears under a microscope. These are the small cell lung cancer and the non-small cell lung cancer. Approximately 87% of lung cancer cases are non-small cell lung cancers. Typical treatments for lung cancer in general includes combinations of chemotherapeutic agents, radiation therapy, and surgery. However, this can be often accompanied by tumor regression in adverse events. And despite the advances in available um, treatments for lung cancer in general, it remains the leading cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide. In addition to that, the prognosis of non-small cell lung cancer specifically remains poor, having only 23% for the five-year survival rate. Advancement in the understanding of immune system has led 
to the development of immunotherapy, immunotherapy rather against cancer. Immunotherapy, as we know, can be passive or active. Passive, like in the case of monoclonal antibodies, or active, such as in the case of vaccines. Well, one of the targets of active immunotherapy in cancers are the overexpressed receptors, like in the case of tumor-associated antigens, or TAAs. TBRs have been implicated in the development of diseases like cancer. One of these is the G-protein cobalt receptor 56. Immunohistochemistry ex um, studies and overexpression studies showed that GBR56 is overexpressed in non-small cell lung cancer and is involved in promoting its proliferation and invasion. In addition to that, it has been correlated with its TNM stages. Besides um, non-small cell lung cancer, GBR56 overexpression has been also associated with the progression of other cancer types such as colorectal cancer and um, gliomas. Um, now, as a confirmatory step, I conducted a gene expression profiling of non-small cell lung cancer using the gene expression omnibus database. Results showed significant overexpression for ADGRG1, the gene which encodes for GPR56, wherein there's a significant overexpression in non-small cell lung cancer, twice higher than that of the normal adjacent tissues using different probes. So as you can see in this figure, we have the expression of ADGRG1 in the non-small cell lung cancer sample compared to that of the normal adjacent tissue. As you can see, it is approximately twice higher than that of the normal cells or normal tissues. The same is also true for the other probe. Okay, so this table shows you uh, the uh, mapped B cell and CD4 positive epitopes on the protein sequence of GPR56. This contains the epitopes, sequence, uh, start and end position, as well as antigenicity. And based from the antigenicity threshold used in this study, all of these mapped epitopes are classified as antigenic. Well, the population coverage for the CD4 positive epitopes worldwide is estimated to be 83.81%, while for the other areas where the uh, lung, lung uh, cancer has a high incidence rate, ranges from 60.8%, like for example in China, to 90.2% in the USA. This uh, second figure shows you the schematic representation of FVAX candidate vaccine construct. So as you can see, it uh, contains a V or valent residue at its end terminal, aiming to increase its half-life, and also C, terminus um, 6 histidine tag, which can aid for its purification processes. Now, the candidate B uh, linear epitopes here are in red, while the candidate T helper cell epitopes are in blue, and these are all adjoined via the GPG linkers. As you can see, we also have here the D0 to D1 domains in green. These are the domains from the flagellin of Salmonella typhimurium. Okay, so these are used adjoined via the EAAK linkers to be used as an adjuvant in this vaccine. I also conducted um, in silico physical chemical um, property evaluation for FVAX, and it showed no significant sequence similarity with other known human proteins in the database. It is only specific for uh, GPR56, which is the target in the study. It is also classified as antigenic, non-allergen, non-toxic, and it has a 100-hour um, half-life in mammalian reticulocytes. It is classified to be thermally stable and hydrophilic, which means it can be easily mixed with or combined with polar solvent, such as water. Okay, um, for this three figures, um, these show you the graphical 
representations of the secondary structures in A, solvent accessible regions in B, and disordered regions in C within FX. Now, uh, based from these graphs, the series of linear B cell epitopes are located within the solvent accessible regions, disordered regions, random coils, and extended strands, which further emphasize their exposure. And very important in constructing a vaccine. Now, this fourth figure shows you the tertiary structure model of FVAX as viewed in PyMol. This was predicted, refined, and validated using several quality factors such as ERAT, wherein uh, there is an improvement from 85.13 to 89.43 for the refined model structure. Also true for the Ramachandran plot values, wherein the amino acids um, within the most favored regions improved from 87.9 to 92.4%. And also for the Z-scores, for the refined model, it laid closer to the shaded region in blue of the native structures from negative 4.47 to negative 4.67. Uh, These two figures show you the positions of the series of candidate linear B-cell epitopes. And it simply uh, tells us that this series of B-cell epitopes are part of this continuous and uh, linear structural epitopes of FVAX, making it more immunogenic. And the, lastly, this is the map of FVAX DNA clone, which contains uh, the FVAX optimized DNA sequence in red, approximately 1,500 base pairs. By the way, this work um, has been recently published last August 1. Thank you for listening. Uh, before formally ending, I would like to say something about COVID-19. We know that uh, it has a devastating impact in our economy and in our um, health facilities. And with the high rates of transmission and no curative therapies or even vaccines yet available for this disease, patients with lung cancer, they are a particularly vulnerable population. We need to consider that. And a challenge nowadays is to balance the risk of an infection with COVID-19 against the consequences of delaying, or worse, not treating lung cancer or other cancer types in general. So the current cornerstone of cancer management must focus on prevention of COVID-19 infection by social distancing between the healthcare professionals and wearing complete PPEs while still providing for their patients treatment or diagnosis safely. So that's it for me. Thank you for listening. On behalf of my co-investigators and collaborators, I would like to thank the AOS for selecting our study for presentation in this forum. Here are my disclosures. On August 29 of this year, Chadwick Boseman at age 43 died of metastatic colon cancer after battling this disease for four years. His death stirred the whole world with the phenomenon of early onset colorectal cancer, or CRC, which has been steadily increasing since the 1990s. In the Philippines, it appears that incidence is much higher compared to other countries, with a reported incidence of 17%. Recognizing early onset CRC as a growing public health problem and knowing that it is, it is described as a distinct disease entity with its own unique genetic features, we embarked on a research program involving genome profiling of young onset CRC among Filipinos. This would allow us to better understand the molecular pathophysiology of the, of the disease, especially among Filipinos where a higher incidence has been observed. Due to the ongoing genetic analysis, I'm not at liberty to, dis to disclose the results at this time. What I am reporting today is the data on DNA mismatch repair status. A deficient status is closely linked with high mi microsatellite instability or MSI, which is a marker of good prognosis. It, is, it also predicts a good response to immunotherapy in the metastatic setting, while in the adjuvant setting, it predicts poor response to 5-FU-based chemotherapy. MMR deficient or DMMR status is also a hallmark of Lynch syndrome the most common cause of hereditary CRC manifesting in the young. 
However, testing for MMR is still limited throughout the country despite recommendations from clinical practice guidelines. One objective of the study was to determine the frequency of DMMR and proficient tumors or PMMR based on immuno immunohistochemistry or IHC. We chose IHC as the technique used because it is highly concordant with PCR and next generation sequencing in determining MSI status. It is highly sensitive and specific and more feasible to perform in a resource limited setting with the added advantage of identifying the MMR genes likely to be mutated. A second objective was to compare the clinical pathologic profiles of DMMR and PMMR uh, tumors using these features listed. Here are the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the study. 124 patients were recruited and 98 of these patients were able to turn over uh, tumor samples. And of the 98 tissue blocks retrieved, IHC was performed in 77 samples. IHC was not performed on the rest of the samples for reasons concerning quality and quantity. MMR status was reported based on the presence or absence of the four key DNA proteins, namely MLH1, MESH2, MESH6, and PMS2. PMMR tumors were identified by diffuse brownish nuclear staining by all antibodies against the four MMR proteins, as you see here in this slide. Complete absence of nuclear staining with at least one of the four MMR proteins demonstrates deficiency in MMR. Here you see on the left an MMR tumor deficient in MLH1 and PMS2, while on the right you see the reverse, a tumor deficient in MESH2 and MESH6. Of the 77 tissue stained, 61 samples were proficient while 16 samples were deficient in MMR proteins. And among the 16 DMMR tumors, almost half were deficient in MESH2 and MESH6. Let's look now into some of the clinical pathologic features of the patients based on MMR status. The mean age upon diagnosis was similar to both groups at 37 years, which is lower than the mean age of onset of 45 years reported in the US. For both MMR groups, more patients clustered into the higher age brackets between 30 to 45 years. The percentage of male and female patients were nearly equal for both PMMR and DMMR groups. Looking at clinical stage, you would notice that a great proportion of PMMR patients present with stage 4 disease. However, we shouldn't be misled to thinking that there are fewer metastatic cases in the DMMR group. This is because most patients presented with metastatic disease in this study, and they no longer underwent curative resection, precluding retrieval of adequate tissues for testing. For location, we classified primary tumors as either left-sided or right-sided. And in this graph, we clearly see that there seems to be a greater proportion of right-sided tumors in the DMMR group compared to the PMMR group. Some reports have pointed out that right-sided tumors are more associated with MSI high status, which may explain the higher proportion of right-sided DMMR tumors. It is also notable that one case having synchronous tumors in the ascending colon and the rectum was seen in the DMMR, DMMR group. Counting only the specimens with reported tumor grade, we see no difference between the two groups in terms of tumor differentiation. Although poor differentiation is a feature of DMMR tumors, this is not seen in our results. It's interesting to note that more than half of DMMR tumors presented with aggressive histologic variants, more commonly of the mucinous type. We also looked into the family history as it suggests, or it may suggest, Lynch syndrome. A negative family history, however, does not totally rule out Lynch due to recall biases and lack of penetrance of gene mutations. So confirmation through genetic testing would still be necessary for these cases. We see from this graph that around 25% of patients in the proficient group versus around 31% in the deficient group reported a positive family history. Logistic regression analysis of these clinical pathologic features showed that having more relatives with cancer, the presence of right-sided tumors, and having aggressive histologic features increase the probability of having a DMMR tumor. 
However, none of these associations were statistically significant due to the limited sample size. This is the first study to profile MMR status among Filipinos with young onset CRC, showing that around 21% of samples presented with DMMR status and that the most common deficiency was MESH2 and MESH6. Right-sidedness, aggressive histologic features, and positive family history may suggest a DMMR tumor. Our study has several limitations. First, patients from only two hospitals within the National Capital Region inadequately represent the entire population of young Filipinos with CRC. Second, variability in reporting standards among pathology labs hampered comparison of PMMR and DMMR tumors based on tumor grade. Third, the small number of specimens affected estimated frequencies. Our recommendations are to expand the sample size to, ex to capture a more accurate profile of patients and to perform genomic profiling and reverse genetic studies. Ge reverse genetic studies will allow us to better understand gene functions to provide a better understanding of CRC pathophysiology and possible drug development strategies. I'd like to acknowledge the patients who made this study possible. And I'd like to thank the members of the UPPGH colorectal cancer and polyp study group and the Disease Molecular Biology and Epigenetics Lab of the NIMBB for inspiring me to pursue this research. We will now proceed with opening the floor for questions on any of the three research presentations. Good evening once again. Welcome to our live open forum. Welcome Dr. Sakdalan, Dr. Herrera. I'm afraid Dr. Han Song Bai cannot make it tonight. Um, the floor is now open for questions. I believe we received a question earlier. Uh, for Dr. Herrera, is there any validation or clinical studies on its way? Thank you for the question. Um, as of now, we are currently eyeing for a future uh, collaboration, which may include um, uh, insertion of the gene encoding the vaccine in a vector and expressing it in a uh, cell system, like, for example, um, E. coli, and then uh, collection of lysate, purification, and uh, testing in, uh, for example, uh, toxicity in animal models, um, validation, for example, of its um, immunogenicity in animal models. So as of now, we are still looking for future collaborations. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Now, this is a very interesting work that you're doing, and we're really looking forward to more studies on this. Uh, for Dr. Dennis Saktalan, um, what are your thoughts in performing MMR testing among patients with pre-cancer States like dysplasia. Hmm, that's uh, that's interesting you know, because uh, we usually um, well the, rec the the guidelines recommend uh, doing routine MMR testing or MSI testing for diagnosed cases of colorectal cancer, but for precancer states like dysplasia, it um, I'm really not sure of what uh, what uh, the evidence is. Um, there may be indications to do this, uh, maybe. For um, uh, let's say young patients who who are suspected to be uh, having hereditary syndromes like Lynch, and so this may be um, an indication for it. But I think uh, we'll have to look at other clinical features to see if this is uh, really um, warranted. Thank you. Um, actually, I would I would like to commend you also on your pioneering work on on trying to determine the MMR status of our young Filipino cancer patients. Um, I just have one question also. Um, are your findings um, consistent with literature in terms of uh, the other clinical features such as the sex distribution, clinical stage, tumor-sidedness, or degree of differentiation? Well, our study was really limited by the small sample size. Uh, we didn't really get uh, to, to um, recruit uh, enough patients to um, make our results more significant. Um, as, you, as I reported earlier, the, there were some results that weren't really that consistent with uh, what we saw in literature as, uh, regarding stage, um, because we really do expect more advanced stages in these younger patients, especially the, um, uh, uh, well, for, for young onset colorectal cancers. There's also the problem with the um, 
uh, differentiation, we, we would expect more poorly differentiated uh, tumors in uh, deficient uh, or DMMR tumor um, groups. However, this was not seen in our study because, again, we were limited by sample size. But as far as sex distribution is concerned and uh, age, I think it's a uh, little more consistent with uh, what is in the literature right now. Okay, thank you. Um, for Dr. Herrera, um, currently the treatment for lung cancer depends on molecular markers, um, which expressed mostly in non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer. It's expressed mostly or more, most likely it was more studied in that, in that uh, histology. Do you think that GR, uh, GPR-56 expressed differently among the different histologies of lung cancer? Um, I think that would be uh, too early for me to, to, to say because uh, what I did in uh, the differential gene expression analysis is to just uh, compare non-small cell lung cancer generally uh, regardless of the histology versus those with uh, normal cells. So I am... Um, I'm not yet um, equipped to answer whether it would be upregulated in different types of histology or not. So as of now, we are still um, in the surface. <laughs> yeah, we understand, we understand. But we're really looking forward to more studies for both uh, the research topics for uh, MMR status in young Filipino colorectal patients and, of course, for a tumor vaccine. So... Um, I, I think there are no more questions. Uh, um, if there are no more questions, we will now uh, close this session. Congratulations again to our researchers for their excellent work. And thank you all for your participation. Enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>